frustrating you? Uh, can I see the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So we'll just get started. Uh, first of all, I appreciate um, William James College for the invite to come out and talk to you all about the uh, psychology the sessions that the Air Force provides. Um, we're the 318th Recruiting Service Team uh, located in Burlington, Massachusetts, and we're the Talent Acquisitions Team here for this area. Um, our guest speaker today is Major Tubman, and he is the Clinical Psychology Internship Trainer Director, Training Director. Um, and cool, so go ahead, next slide. Cool, so today we're gonna go over Air Force internships, practice of psychology in the Air Force, and direct the sessions. So these are all the qualifications in order to join um, for different portions of the Air Force uh, clinical psychology. We have the clinical psychologist HPSP, the clinical psychologist resident program, and then we also have the fully qualified clinical psychology program. All right, so under internships, um, basically the internships are uh, located at Wilford Hall in uh, San Antonio, Texas, and DC, and Wright Patterson, Ohio. Cool. All right, so um, training, uh, perfect time to, to bring Major Tubman into the briefing. Uh, training portions, sir, if you wanted to speak on training, you're more than welcome. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Arnold. Um, so we are, all three of our Air Force programs that um, she just mentioned have some similarities in that they're all APA accredited and they've been for decades. Um, they're all very much focused on training generalist psychologists. So there, there are opportunities to specialize within the Air Force, but, um, and, and many of us do, I'm a clinical health psychologist. I went to a, a fellowship in health psych. Um, but what I, what I like to say is that internship year is a year where we are training you to be a Swiss army knife psychologist. Um, the needs are so great that, um, and the context where you might be functioning as a psychologist, as soon as you get out of internship are so diverse. Um, you might, you, most likely you'll, you'll end up in a clinic, uh, but you won't likely be very, you won't very much um, likely be just seeing patients. Um, you'll be doing fit for duty assessments. You'll be doing command consultation. You'll be doing some type of community, really kind of community mental health or population health outreach initiatives. Um, I, I, I did some forensic work, you know, for example, um, and then pretty quickly you get put in charge of something where you're, you might be in charge of a substance abuse clinic or um, doing things like suicide prevention work or being in charge of disaster mental health efforts um, after, you know, community affected traumatic events. And I could probably just keep going on about the different types of uh, opportunities that you'll have. So for that reason, our, our training programs are about how do we help you think like a psychologist um, so that you can take those skills, sci scientist practitioner skills and, um, and apply them to, to whatever it is that you end up doing uh, thereafter. Um, yeah, our program here at Wright-Patterson Wright in Dayton, Ohio, we take um, the number fluctuates plus or minus, but we, we take five or six um, as does the program in DC. And then Wolford Hall is the larger program where um, they take usually between 10 and 13. Um, so that's a pretty good sized class. <clears throat> and, you know, as, as, as if training you to be a good psychologist isn't enough to accomplish in a year, we also are very much training you how to be in the military and how to be an officer and a leader. Um, so it's a pretty packed year. 
Um, and that, that really is the main pipeline that we take in active duty psychologists, but it's not the only one and other opportunities or other options are, are expanding. Um, so right now you can, you can join after you get licensed as a direct session. Um, and really what we do there is we, we just, uh, once you're licensed and fully qualified and you get, you get, uh, commissioned on as a, usually as a captain, but uh, sometimes you get constructive credit toward rank where you can come in at, at a higher rank. Um, then the training model is on the job training and getting you up to speed with what it means to be a military psychologist, because um, presumably you came in with good skill set to be a, a generalist psychologist. And um, and the, what we're rolling out too, and this this would probably be in, in place for um, you, Jose, and, and Tanjiro, by the time that uh, you're interested is some that we're calling a notch fellowship, but it's basically, um, it's a year postdoc that's basically focused on become, being an Air Force psychologist. So um, the model for that is probably gonna be that we take people who are already licensed um, and you go to a civilian internship somewhere, it's gotta be APA accredited, you gotta come from an APA accredited program um, like y'all do, but your internship does have to be APA accredited. And then, you'll be at a training site where you're not an intern, but you are, um, the purpose of that discrete year is to get you up to speed with the nuances of being an officer and being a Air Force psychologist. Um, and then the other, the other training avenue that we have is um, doing fellowship programs, um, which uh, is, I think there's a slide for that. Is that, is that right, Tarno? Yeah, so I've talked more about that, but. Um, that's really kind of the overview of the training programs. There are, there are more nuances and details, you know, in, in our brochures and things that we could talk about if y'all have questions. But. Perfect. Thank you so much, sir. Cool. So uh, some of the benefits of the Air Force internships, obviously, is student loan repayment program uh, or the retention bonus that may be available after the initial commitment. Um, and... The, like, like Major Tubman said, the unusual opportunities that you can't find elsewhere uh, in the civilian sector um, is stuff that is able to go on your resume if you're just planning on making this maybe a four to six year commitment um, and then getting out and using your specialty elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's important to have these extra things that can go, go on there for your experience. And the, uh, the, the student loan repayment, that's going to be for HPSP, which is your, your sponsor, if you go that route. Um, or I'm sorry, student loan repayment is going to be fully qualified. If you go on fully qualified, the, H, the sponsorship is your last two academic years sponsored by the Air Force to include your internship. So those, the student loan repayments is different than the actual scholarship. Are, are y'all tracking with the info so far? Kind of a lot, but do you have any questions? Or... Uh, yes, sir, I'm tracking. How are you, Tanji? I'm good so far, thanks. <laughs> and Cap Neckman joined us too. Cap Neckman, uh, are you audio only or do you have a, do you have visual too? Maybe not even uh, audio. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I have both. Oh, cool. It took me a second to figure out both, but I got it. <laughs> so Captain Ekman is a current resident um, at Wright-Patterson. So she's she's going through the internship here. More than halfway done. Look at that. <laughs> Perfect. Congrats. Wow. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So the internship and residency, it all starts with the commissioned officer training, which happens in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and then the internship usually starts in the first week of August and ends mid-August of the following year. Um, and it's a very demanding year, um, as you can see, and Major Tubman already attested to this, but you have a lot going on in that first year of training, um, not only to learn, uh, you know, becoming a psychologist, but on top of that, becoming an officer as well in the Air Force. All right, next slide. Cool. Maybe clarify the OTS, the difference between the training. 
compared to that. so OTS just when when you're when you're there it has nothing really to do with psychology but everything to do with how to be an officer in the Air Force. Um, so there's going to be a difference between between going to officer training school and then getting to your residency if you go that route and mm -hmm. or qualified opportunities as well. Yeah, you, you got to imagine like so um, we as graduate students in psychology have, you know, a lot in common with dentists or chaplains or social workers or lawyers um, in that, you know, we prefer uh, pursuing civilian careers. May maybe you have the HPSB scholarship or not, but your life is not about wearing the uniform and customs and courtesies are really not expected to know what you're supposed to do once you do put on that uniform. But, um, you know, you come in as a captain, which is a, you know, pretty good amount of rank and people around base and people that you interact with to include your patients and their commanders and first sergeants and um, even people that are part of your clinic um, reasonably have the expectation that you'll know a few things about being in the military um, in addition to knowing more than a few things about being a psychologist. So um, that that five-week period and, and Cap Neckman just did it last summer. Um, is all about yeah helping you figure out it was really a crash course and like here's a, here's some things about being in the military that that you ought to know. Um, Captain Eckman, would you add anything? I mean, going to OTS most recently of any of us. Um, I mean, COVID definitely impacted a lot of it. Um, so we didn't get as many opportunities to work with other flights or. Um, you know, uh, other leadership opportunities like that, but it definitely gives you a crash course. You have to read what they call an Otsman, um, which gives you real quick down and dirty information on how to be an officer in the Air Force and customs and courtesies of being in the Air Force. Um, so it's definitely a lot of information, but it's helpful. It's everybody on more or less the same page. Uh, mm -hmm some basic stuff. <laughs> yes. So then, uh, so first assignments, the way that that process works, um, your postdoctoral assignment is made in the spring. Uh, just like it says on here, interns are asked to rank order um, their preferences of assignments, but this is based off of the Air Force needs. Um, so obviously, if you're putting down like Great Patterson, Ohio, uh, and they have availabilities there, you're most likely going to be matched there. But if you're putting down Great Patterson, Ohio, they don't have any availabilities there. They'll try to best match you. So they'll go to your next preference on the list. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, your highest level of responsibilities um, after your internship is you may start as a program element lead for like ADAPT or something like that. And then you also may lead teams such as disaster, mental health, those kind of things. Um, and then licensure is stressed and supported. So they wanna make sure that you're able to um, grow and expand within the program. And that's like, sorry, normal. I think that's one thing that as I was learning about the Air Force, I realized Boy, there are a lot of expectations like there's a lot of responsibility and what I was told was and you're given a lot of training and support to meet those expectations and the reason why I've stuck around for as long as I have um, is because I found that to be true you know and that um, a lot is asked of us like you know um, but we're not just left out there dangling. We have a really good support network. Um, and our, you know, our internship, is, as we talk about how busy it is, we also, the people who train you all know that you will be one of us for the next three years at least um, when you're done with internships. So um, we're super invested in making sure that you're the best you can be during that, that amount of time um, in a way that a single year internship, I just think, you know, just this time of year, you'd already have whatever you're doing next lined up, 
you know, and you'd be probably leaving the VA or leaving whatever organization it is where, um, boy, we just, we're so motivated to get people um, just as, as great as they can possibly be. So we give them the high expectations, but also the resources and the support and the training and funding when it's needed and um, you know, stuff to really make the chances of success that much greater. So, um, yeah, I think uh, the support that the Air Force gives, I mean, not only uh, not only in the actual job to make you feel comfortable, but I think on top of that, they try to guide you the best way possible for um, like leadership responsibilities, those kinds of things, because they know that you're going to be the one that's taking over their position next so they can go and do the next position and so on and so forth. Um, so I think that that's, that's really great. Um, and that happens on all levels in the Air Force. So um, I think that it's very important for the Air Force to grow within. Um, cool. So going back to the slide. Um, so uh, for the practice, um, therapy assessment and consultation, um, and then psychological uh, consultant to the community. You'll also be providing uh, assistance and help as needed to the community as well where you're stationed, if needed. Cool. Well, so Air Force practice versus civilian practices. Um, I'll let you guys just read that over. And then if you have any questions, please feel free to let us know. And if you guys want to hit on any of this stuff, you are more than welcome. Uh, the psychologist that I talked to at the uh, sorry. <laughs> um, I know that insurance part of it uh, was was a big deal mm -hmm. um, since we, we're all under Tricare, so and um, you know it's all done within the clinic, so it's not really anything that psychologists or any healthcare professional has to worry about um, in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's fine. You, have to, you don't have to worry about what the work each day because then I mean, you can see the major right now. Um, we have uniforms. Um, so that's the insurance part was always uh, a question you know, that I ran into. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the moving, um, once again, based off the Air Force needs. Mm -hmm. uh, and your time on station. Uh, so uh, when when we do our appointments with any applicant, we want to make sure if there are spouses, family, influencers of any kind, uh, to invite them to that appointment so that we can answer their questions too. Just because it's not just you joining the Air Force, it's your it's it's your family members, uh, your spouse, or whoever. So we want to make sure that they know and understand everything that that you're getting into and that they're going to be supporting you um, during that time. Um, but at the same time, it, it, next slide, it, it can be exciting, the places you go. Uh, for example, I was stationed in Italy for five years. Uh, two of my, my boys were born there. Um, and, you know, they, they still talk about it um, because now we're here in Boston and um, they just started school because we, we just moved here. Um, but they just started school a couple weeks ago and they still talk to their friends about living in Italy and living in Wisconsin and Utah and things like that. So um, it's a, for me, it's been a great experience for my family um, just because, I mean, I never got that as a kid um, moving around. I grew up in Pennsylvania and didn't leave until I joined the military. So um, <clears throat> expenses paid, uh, I can attest to that one as well. Like I said, I just moved here, government, Paid for Air Force paid for movers. I move all my stuff. I'm living on base, so I don't even pay rent. Um, movers dropped everything off. Uh, flew half. My my wife and my two boys flew. Uh, Air Force paid for that, and then I drove with my other son and my two dogs. Um, all taken care of with every move that the Air Force has you do to a new base. Um, but yeah, wanted to get on that. Have you all heard anything? Um, I don't know. Heard of any? I mean, there there certainly are plenty of downsides too. But do you all have you heard of any concerns, or would you do you have any questions or thoughts or things out there um, 
that do speak to some of the negatives about working in our environment as psychologists that um, myself or Captain Ekman might be able to address? Or... Is there like, because, you know, just like truth in advertising, there's good things and not so good things about every work environment. Um, these are all 100% true, I would say. Um, you know, um, what we challenge people to think about is, yeah, do, you know, for example, with with care, like our patients don't have to pay for, for therapy, which is really cool. You know, um, they have access to care. Um, I don't know. Do, um, do you all think like there could sometimes, like what do you imagine might be some downsides to that arrangement? Um, or some things, maybe consideration as you're thinking about therapy with um, our pe our population who has free healthcare, who's also part of the same wearing the same uniform as us. <laughs> I can imagine it might be difficult to see people who have a higher rank than you, or even people who have a lower rank than you, who might feel like beholden to do what you said to do because you said to do it, because they don't understand the diff you know the 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 difference in the command structure between medical and non-medical. Oh yeah. Yeah. I view myself as David and I'm not looking at my rank usually, but that's not how other people view me to include my patients. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, And that's in the therapy room, um, whether you choose for it to be or not. Um, and that it's not without effect for sure. I wonder if another thing comes up about um, like people worrying about talking to you because of clearances and then also the dual sort of um, the dual client that your, your client is the government. I mean, you're, you're beholden to the commander. And so if you come, somebody comes in and they say something that you can't, you got to talk to the, the commander calls you and says, I know Susie came in the other day. <laughs> What's going on. Right. So it's not necessarily as, um, secure as it would be outside the military because the military is a whole nother land. Although that is, I love it, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah, it's such an incredible nuance and such an important really ethical consideration. You know, we're not unique in that we're not the only organization that exists that has obligations to your patient and also obligations to maybe your patient as the organization, right? So like police officers, um, FBI, psychologists, um, you know, if you're, if you're working in an IO type of a role, um, but it's, it's real, you know, and it is, um, it's not the case that our appointment is 100% confidential unless you are at imminent risk of harm to self or others like it is in, in civilian sectors. We also have obligations to help protect the mission of the Air Force which um, can include recommending that somebody not leave your office and go uh, put on a weapon or go fly an airplane or, um, or deploy to a combat zone um, or even stay in the military. You know, so these um, dual roles that, we, that are inherent in our job as both uh, psych consultant, um, that, that's... That's part of, uh, that's why we need such incredible people here who, um, in our organization who know ethic standards and are committed to them because um, the pull on either direction can be problematic, you know? Um, but yeah, totally. And we, we, we spend this whole year uh, talking about those circumstances and training people on how to problem solve because um, each scenario will present with it new ethical challenges and, um, ones that we really have to be thoughtful about. Yeah, I, I, I view those like they are, they're sometimes headaches with our organization of like, ah, oh, I wish this, really care about this person. And I wish that, you know, um, their substance use disorder that is affecting their job functioning. I, I wish I could just stay out of that entirely. Um, I, I've had those urges, but, the other side to that is also, um, you know, it, it does force you to think about and really come into contact with how meaningful our jobs really are. And that this 
person that you're sitting across from does some really important, really high stress, really high risk work that um, by the nature of helping them, I'm also contributing to that broader mission. Um, and, and sometimes that, that does involve doing things or making recommendations that, um, you know, are, are fraught with challenge. And, and there's some, something about that that's also exciting and stimulating and challenging and, and um, not just a headache. <laughs> Major Tubman, as, as, a, as an Air Force psychologist, what would I be expecting in terms of what would my workload be like, what would my hours be like, and what kind of work would I be doing, let's say, on, uh, in a week? Yeah, that question changes so much, um, and it changes so much from when you're an intern to when you're functioning in, in real psychology, but let me give you the, the biggest part of the pie chart, at least, you know, like, I'll give you a something, I'll give you as stereotypical as we can get. Um, so my first duty station was at Travis Air Force Base in Northern California, and my first job was as a staff psychologist. and that means that my primary role was patient care and i the the full time equivalent is five patients per day um on average and that's what you get templated for so a combination of intakes one time evaluations and then follow up psychotherapy you might have some groups thrown in there too um but you notice pretty quickly that that's 25 hours in a 40 to 45, sometimes 50 hour work week, but you know, generally 45 or so. Um, so the rest of the time is spent consulting with commanders. It's spent developing outreach initiatives kind of as needed. It's spent doing your own training because we have a lot of training as military members. Um, and then pretty quickly you start taking on additional responsibilities. So not necessarily a duty title change. You're still a psychologist, that's your job staff psychologist. But one of the first jobs I was in charge of was doing um, readiness training for mental health providers. So as a young psychologist, they had me read up a whole bunch on um, and, and interview people and come up, you know, use pre-existing training materials on what is it like to be deployed as a psychologist. Now, I hadn't even deployed it yet, but I had to do a training for people on that or um, be in charge of the base's suicide prevention efforts and coordinate with other helping agencies. Um, so your first couple years outside of internship, you're probably staff psychologist and then you're doing these other things, sometimes because you're told to do it and then other times because you're interested and you wanna do it. So there's a combination of, of, of both of those types of initiatives. I've always been somebody who's just interested in trying Ooh, I want to, I want to do that. I want to get involved in that. So I've, I've always been, been pretty busy. Um, and then from there, once you're a staff psychologist, the next kind of progression that you do is you are, um, you'll be in charge of something formally. So your job will become, um, as Sarnaro mentioned earlier, um, ADAP, that's our substance abuse clinic. You'll be in charge of that clinic, or we call them elements in the air force. So I had, um, about five technicians and a couple of different providers. And our sole focus was prevention and treatment of substance use disorders at Travis Air Force Base. And I treated patients, but probably only about half time. And then I oversaw patients, patient care in that clinic. And then I still had these other kind of side projects um, that I was doing. And then from there, it's, you kind of, you start doing less and less direct patient care but it never shrinks to zero. You're, you're never allowed to see no patients unless you're doing some fancy job that's outside of the field. Um, you know, you can expect that the, the least it would get is probably like, I don't know, five to eight patients per week. Um, and these are traditional clinical roles. What we're doing a lot more and more nowadays in the Air Force too is putting mental health providers into embedded roles. So the Army does this a lot, the Navy does this a lot, but basically instead of your job being in a clinic, in an office, part of the medical team, you're part of the intelligence squadron, 
and your boss is an intelligence officer and you have an office in that unit that's not a medical unit or the police unit or special forces or whatever it is. Um, and, and there the ratio of patient care to other responsibilities is totally different from what I just told you. Um, but that that's that is a uh, a general description of probably how you can expect your workload to be divided. Kabnek, would you add anything? She, she's an intern, so she, her workload is all over the place. <laughs> that is very true. Uh, and I just push rotation, so that adds some yeah. unique, unique changes. Um, I don't think so. I don't think I'd add anything else. Um, because there is definitely, I think, even as a resident, there's a balance that faculty here at Wright Patterson have tried to teach us of balancing a leadership role on top of patient care, on top of on call responsibilities, um, anything and everything that you could think of that you might be thrown into starting after this year um, so that we can be as prepared as possible. I mean, it's definitely complicated to learn the balance, but you know, it's it's needed in order to be successful moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thank you um, both for your input on that. Um, so another thing between um, the differences between the Air Force practices versus the civilian uh, would be assignments. So just like I said before, um, you're going to be able to list your assignment preferences. Uh, and right now we have over 75 uh, military treatment facilities worldwide. And um, you just put them down. The, like I said, the Air Force will best match you to what they need as well. Um, and then the second portion on this, on this slide is uh, just like Major Tubman really hit on before, um, commander support and prevention and treatment. So that's uh, one of the main focuses for clinical psychology is that you want to make sure that you're um, not only there for the people to take care of them, but also to take care of the mission as well. Cool. And then uh, just to continue, um, confidentiality, you guys kind of already hit on that. Um, and then clinician and occupational medicine. Um, so maybe Major Tom Tubman can hit on some of those key factors for those guys. Yeah, that, so like occupational health stuff, um, I didn't know a bunch about, I didn't know much about that before I joined, um, but this is that dual role that we play in that um, every time we see somebody, at least running in the back of our mind, we have to be thinking, what does this person do for a living? What do they do in the Air Force? How does how does their functioning uh, factor into that? And um, how might I serve, if need be, serve as a consultant to make it so that they're not being put in a situation that would make their suffering worse um, or in a, in a counterproductive way or, and or not um, exposing themselves or other people to undue risk as a result from where they're at? Cool, thank you for that. Fine. So um, postdoctoral fellowships, uh, I know Major Tubman had hit on that a little earlier. I don't know if you wanted to go more into depth on that or. Yeah, there is an important difference in most military sites, and I think all military sites, than um, <clears throat> what, what you can expect in the civilian sector. So um, have either of you two thought about pursuing specialty training like a fellowship? I know it's so far away, but um, what what kind of fellowships have you thought about? Um, I'm interested in forensic and neuropsychology specifically, so cool. it's kind of researching those. Yeah, how about you, Jose? Uh, mine's been I'm, I'm very much uh, military focused with my career path, so I know that after the first. After I do the initial years as a psychologist, I'm able to kind of specialize, and I've been looking at mm -hmm. the different well, like, different communities available to uh, to attend. Some, you know, working I mean, aerospace kind of you know psychology really calls out to me. It's just uh, yeah. it sounds really cool. 
Yeah, yeah, it sure does. Um, uh, which we have here, right, Pat, by the way, we have the human performance wing where they do the aeromedical consultation service. Uh, Cap Neckman's doing that later, later this year. Um, so fellowships in the Air Force. So I, I did, I did a fellowship in 2017. I joined the Air Force in 2010. So, and I was licensed and board certified for over five years by the time I became a fellow, which is not the traditional pathway in the civilian sector. Um, and if I, I guess if somebody were interested in being a forensic psychologist as soon as you possibly can, becoming a neuropsychologist or um, even child, whatever it is, then I, I think it's true for all of the military, but it's, it's true for the Air Force and that there really aren't many opportunities to just have this beeline pathway. And probably in the beginning of my graduate training, I would have said, well, that's a major drawback. Geez, you know, I got to put my career on hold. Um, but I'll tell you my experience and my opinion, and you can decide what to do with it. But um, I would not have chosen health psychology when I So you might have just timed out real quick. They're still moving. Electronics at Wright Patterson are notorious for uh, kicking us out. <laughs> <laughs> That's surprising. They're supposed to be the best there, right? <laughs> think being military technology would be down pat but it's not i know they leave the, the way on that stuff there yeah i can't even sign into zoom on my government computer i have to use my phone oh. yeah. so major tubman the last thing we heard you say was you didn't even consider health psychology that's when you got cut off i did not consider health psychology i didn't know much about it i thought i wanted to be a neuropsychologist if i had to make the decision during internship year i would have chosen neuropsych and I would have regretted it. Um, or I don't know. But I could say I'm super happy being a health psychologist. So I could, I could say I would have regretted it, but who knows, I guess. Um, the way that I learned that I wanted to be a health psychologist was getting out into the Air Force and getting a better understanding of what the needs are. And what the needs are that I care most about, um, not that neuropsych is not a need, it's a huge need, but the, the things that I was confronted with was we need a, the ability to help a whole bunch of people who don't have mental health problems necessarily, but could stand to benefit in making uh, positive lifestyle and behavior changes to prevent problems down the road. And I was repeatedly confronted with that as uh, in my work as a substance use uh, clinic uh, chief or in my work doing suicide prevention or in my work doing working with sexual assault um, prevention. We're not treating disorders. What we're trying to do is help large groups of people make small changes so that the trajectory of health for the group is improved. And um, I didn't know I was excited and passionate about that topic until I got out into the field and realized, boy, there's a huge need and this seems like a lot of fun and I'd love to do that. Um, so I joined, I became a fellow seven years into my career, having already been a generalist. And I think the consequence of that was I made a better decision on which fellowship to do. I think I took a lot more out of the fellowship because I had a lot more experience um, to draw from. And I think I contributed to the program in a way that I just wouldn't have if I were a 26 year old kid that hadn't really been a psychologist before. Um, and the, another plus side is majors get paid whatever majors get paid, regardless of what their job is. So when I was a flight commander and I was in charge of 30-ish people, the very next year, I didn't even sign my own notes because I was a fellow. Paycheck stayed the same, which was great. <laughs> I didn't have to take the 60% cut that you do in the civilian sector to do a fellowship training you know, and rebuild your career. So. That's my pitch about fellowship training and, and why I think in the long run, it's, a, it's better to, that we get to do it this way. But. Very cool. Well, thanks for that, sir. Um, okay, so the Air Force and your career goals. So 
So I'll let you guys take a minute and just look at this. And then if, if Major Tubman, if you have anything to add to this, sir, you're more than welcome. Yeah, like, I like that. Like, if you'd like to be a snappy dresser, <laughs> if it's not, <laughs> not a good fit for you. Um, Unless you yeah, want to walk I, around in blues all day. Yeah, no, the way you guys get to do that, right, as recruiters? Isn't that yeah, we do. <laughs> um, I, I think that um, people who have a very, uh, a very foreclosed, this is what I want to do and nothing else idea of what their career would look like probably have a hard time but that's not to say that you can't have self-direction i mean we're you're a professional you're a psychologist you're an officer you're not going to have somebody hold your hand and say this is how you be a psychologist and do this don't do that um you really do you're expected to have self-direction in your career direction um, but it really is about are you taking advantage of opportunities as they present themselves? Um, you know, that, that phrase kind of bloom where you're planted. Um, I think if you have that ability um, and that willingness or the willingness to develop those qualities, then you could just do have a really fulfilling, exciting, fun career um, that will have all sorts of challenges um, and, and exciting things. Um, but if you got like this linear path, I want to become a, pediatric neuropsychologist as soon as I possibly can. By the time I'm 28, I need to be this. Then um, you'd have to be, you'd have to ha find some flexibility, I think, to make that happen within, um, within our organization. Yep, so perfect. And then uh, if you're interested, um, to seek more information. These are some of the people that you can find uh, through the internship sites. And perfect opportunity today. I'm glad you guys were able to log on um, is that Major Tubman is actually here and able to speak to you guys directly and answer any questions that you guys have. So we really appreciate him logging in to do this for us today. Yeah, it's super fun, of course. <laughs> There's a website too. So the do y'all do y'all link to the Air Force or Society of Air Force Psychologists website? Somewhere I believe about. I put that on the last page. Cool. Yeah, that, that's like our hub where um, it's in all the APIC materials for you know for internship, where we direct everybody to see up to date brochures and who's the training director and all of our kind of marketing materials where we'll, you know, we get into the weeds with all three training sites on what the rotations are like and what, what what's a day in a life to be an intern and then what's it like to be an Air Force psychologist. And um, so if, if y'all, um, you know, or, or Dr. D'Olympia, if you want to pass that website on to whomever is interested, um, as you could probably guess, myself and the other training directors love talking about what we do and don't consider it, um, you know, we consider it a pleasure for people to reach out and, and want to learn more about it. So um, you should have a pretty low threshold for um, making those connections. And um, so this is how you're able to apply to the Air Force internship. And we will put our information in the chat as well. Um, that way, if you guys, um, can you put it in? Uh, that way, if you guys want to reach out directly, you're more than welcome. Um, or you can find us on airforce.com. Probably what you need to know about this slide um, is everything in green is pretty much what it looks like to apply to any other internship. Um, so those all those boxes are totally accurate, but it's like it's it's epic. It's a putting in your application and then doing interviews and then doing the match day and all that, right? So you're gonna have to do that anyway. The step in the big blue bar up top that really matters, um, and you know why recruiters are just so important is 
um, even if we as training directors think you are the most wonderful person on the planet and you are you would just be such a great Air Force psychologist, you still have to meet standards to be in the military. And there are hoops that you have to jump through uh, with getting paperwork filled out, getting medical clearance, background clearance, um, that kind of stuff um, that we're not very good at helping people with. The recruiters are awesome at helping, helping them with. Um, but those processes have to co-occur because um, if, if you've won us over, but you haven't um, been cleared, well, it, you can't be an intern. Um, likewise, if all you're doing is talking to the recruiters and we don't know who you are and you're not submitting the application stuff and all that, which um, I think that'd be an interesting direction to take, but you know, you, you kind of you have to have them both happening at the same time. Yeah, so these applications are actually, um, they're not like the other applications that we have to do because like the major said, you are going through APIC. Um, and really what we're doing is getting you ready to be an Air Force officer and prep you for OTS as well um, by making sure you're qualified through the military entrance processing station, things like that. Um, but he's right, if, if you're talking to us and you're not going through the other process, there's nothing that can be done. Or if you're talking to one of the internships and you're going through APIC, but you're not talking to a recruiter, you're, you're not gonna move anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so we, with this particular type of recruitment, we have to work with our uh, directors at the internships. Um, Cause I know I work with Dr. HM down at Wilford Hall quite a bit, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we have to stay in communication just so they know who's, who's coming down and, and who's being looked at. All right, and then this is just some information. I'll let you guys take a minute to look at this for APA accredited program. Which there's, is this is this a four or five year school? Uh, four years of schooling and one year of internship. Internship, okay. So yeah, for the scholarship, like when we were talking about what a scholarship would cover, it'd be your third, fourth year and then your internship for anyone who would be interested in HPSB. And for people interested in HPSB, I do have a couple of questions of some students that couldn't make it to the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, when, what, when are they allowed to apply and when is it too late? Um, so they can apply when they're um, within their second year. Of, of their academics, we can start the process depending on um, when that third year will start, we'll determine whether or not it's a traditional start or an immediate start. So for example, and it's got to align when the boards are meeting also. So if your third, if your third year has already started and the board hit and you're a select, we have to apply for an immediate start, meaning we need to tell AFIT, which is Air Force Institute of Technology, that you need funding like now because you're already in that sponsored year. Uh, depending on when you commission, we'll determine when in that year it starts. So you'll find for our HPSB applicants, sometimes it falls like right at the end of a semester and you'll hear us be like, all right, listen, we got to get you commissioned like now, because if we don't commission you before the end of that semester and it's after that semester, then we can't, they won't fund that, that first semester or whatever it is. So when it comes to HPSP, we, we kind of, in an immediate start, depending on when that board and select comes out, sometimes we're like, okay, yeah, we got to get you commissioned. We can do a ceremony later or something like that. Sure. Um, now, if, if the timing is, you know, you're, you're about to start that third year and you're select, we do what's called a traditional start, which basically means AFIT's going to deny your immediate start and say you're qualified for a traditional. And it'll just start, you know, when, when you start school. So you um, can apply your first year, you can apply your second year as well, if I understand correctly? So you can start the application before the end of your second year, because if you start in your first year, there's, you're not going to be able to hit a board until 
the next fiscal year. So there's nothing for you to apply to your first year. Okay, so then so you don't, you just don't have boards for first years. Yeah, so we can't like push you out to, you know, whatever fiscal okay. year. But um, if you're a second year student, mm -hmm. right now, so if right now a student want to apply for the Air Force, they got to contact you like ASAP. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. uh, especially um, if uh, anyone is, which I mean, y'all are in school, but if, if anyone's fully qualified right now, yeah, they'll need to. Anyone else for, did the HPSB happen already? Mm -hmm. no. When is it? May. Is it Okay, so for the HPSP, yeah, you'll want to contact us now. Gotcha. And um, I have a question from a student who is not who is a who is a permanent resident to the U.S. and is working on their citizenship. Okay. Uh, are they allowed to apply to it before they receive their their citizenship to the HPSP program? No, sir. Unfortunately, not. You have to be a U.S. citizen before we can start your process. Gotcha. Thank you. We do have all sorts of immigrants though that have become citizens that are just awesome con contributors to Air Force psychology. So always a big fan of encouraging those folks. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I mean, if you're for fully qualified, um, even if you're within a year of finishing your your internship and, and getting your licensures and everything, become fully qualified, you can still apply as well, as long as you're within that year. Um, the thing is, though, it, it's got to make the timing within OTS as well. Um, so for example, I had somebody um, who in Utah was completing his internship through Southern Utah University, I think it was. Um, and he applied, we went through the whole process and basically we ended up having to just, he did get selected, um, but we just had to push him back to uh, uh, the next fiscal year due to COVID and the timing of when he would actually become a fully qualified psychologist. So if you're within that year, of finishing up your internship, you can still apply. And even if it's something that you think you may want to do before, um, I would get in contact with one of the recruiters so that they have you on radar. Um, and then we can keep on track of, of your progress and, and when you're actually going to be able to meet all the requirements for that. Um, but because, because you don't get your your doctorates until you finish that internship you know that's another reason why we can't push you uh to as a select to an ots uh class date because we need the conferred transcripts mm -hmm. upon completion of the internship so it's two questions i'm sorry sorry i, I can't see your mouth because of the thing so i don't know that you're <laughs> Here, about to keep oh, sorry. We got to wear masks. I know. <laughs> My bad. I can't see you very uh, well. I know. I hate it. <laughs> no, I'm uh, just, I don't, I'm not trying to in interrupt you. I'm just saying it's harder to read from with the big desk. Uh, Major Tubman, did you want to add anything to that or is that okay? No. I, as you were talking, I was reminded why I don't ever try to explain these things. I just say, go talk to a recruiter. <laughs> 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 Yeah, it, you know, the, the good thing, like Air Force needs psychologists um, badly every year. Um, and there, it seems like there are certain things that can be worked out if there are issues such as rolling. And when I say rolling a select to the next fiscal years, because, you know, we have requirements every year that we have to meet. Um, and um, with psychologists being so important to the Air Force and our member, um, even if there is a time constraint to where like maybe there's an issue with you not completing your internship on time to where we can't get you into a class for that fiscal year, sometimes we can get it moved to the next fiscal year um, so that you don't lose your, your select status and have to reapply. So uh, like I said, they, um, 
when it comes to clinical psychology in the Air Force, like I said, they're highly needed. So um, we're, we're able to do a little bit more if, if there are situations that do come up. Um, the next slide here. Oh, it's not on there? Oh, okay. It didn't get added. We'll get up. Sorry, I got it here. He's adding it to the oh, you're adding it now? Okay. So um, it has the Society of Air Force uh, Psychology that Major Tubman was talking about. Um, so um, uh, Sergeant uh, Rivera is adding that right now. So if you guys want to copy, copy that. Uh, it does have our information along with the talent acquisition team uh, email. So when you email that, it goes to the three recruiters responsible uh, for your school, uh, which is Sergeant Arnold, Sergeant Branham, and Sergeant Rivera. So feel free to reach out to us with any additional questions. Um, if you have questions now, we'll, we can stand by. Yeah. I have two questions. What is the age cap for that particular accession, uh, being a fully qualified psychologist? So it's 41, um, but sometimes age waivers are approved for specialties that are highly needed, um, given that they do have to still maintain the same qualifications as everybody else that goes through. Um, so it's, it, uh, it, it really depends on the specialty that they'll grant an age waiver. Yeah, I, I was in, when I went to, it's now called OTS, they used to call it COT or Commission Officer Training, but when I was in COT, um, I was next to a Lieutenant Colonel who had been in the Air Force just as long as me, but be, he was functioning as a licensed pediatrician for I think it was over two decades, and they gave him a, I'm sure he had a big stack of waivers, but they, they really... <laughs> They needed his specialty so much that they said, come on in, join the Air Force. We're going to call you a lieutenant colonel. And he was a lieutenant colonel. Um, and he was certainly over 41. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, and you probably know better than I do with physicians. Um, yeah, there's a lot that can be done with them. Um, yeah. So, uh, and the only way we can find that out is, is by um doing the actual waiver if, if that's a situation that comes up and, and seeing if air force will accept it here's a question are, are there any so i learned recently that um there are some s situations where there's there's no waiver that's going to be considered um and i want to say and, and this tell me if this is wrong but one of them is if somebody has history of taking hallucinogen drugs that that's that's just, you can't get cleared. Um, yeah, maybe Air, Air Force is one of those branches where stuff like that, there's nothing that can save you. Um, I, I think I mean, is, it, is it a long list or is it a short list? Or are there things that like, hey, this is a pretty hard no that if, if somebody has this history, like like not being a citizen is one of them, sure, yeah. taking engines. Are there other things like that that you might um, share with us that? I know. Yeah, I mean, the Air Force uh, is lightning, actually. The, um, I guess, disqualifiers that they uh -huh. have. Um, and right now, uh, like, for instance, uh, marijuana usage, obviously, is legalized in most states. Um, some, some people, uh, I think the the reg right now is 200 times or something like that. You don't have to go and see any type of, um, any type of, I guess, specialist uh, for habitual use. Um, but if it's, uh, and it's acceptable up to 500 times. So, I mean, they're really lightening the things that are coming across. So it's really just case by case basis and it's always changing. So we have a regulation, but it changes like quarterly. So um, I guess- so if, you're like, if you're like a habitual marijuana user, but also like a, one of your hobbies is bookkeeping uh, for the number of times that you use marijuana. Awesome. 
perfect. I mean, hey, if you know that's that you're the best. 500 pounds and you can account for all of that, then uh, I mean, kudos <laughs> to you. But <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, so I guess technically it would be case by case scenario and what the reg says at that moment in time. Sure. Actually, like kind of on the topic, you know, of disqualifiers, I do had a question uh, from somebody. What um is ADHD a disqualifier? So that is a good question. It used to be a disqualifier. Now they're kind of going away from that because uh, the Air Force understands that most kids went through a phase in their life and it used to be, okay, well, we're going to give you this medication. Um, so the Air Force understands that, but it depends on the medication, depends on the last time that was used, and it depends on what you did between the last time you used it and to the point where you are today. So for instance, if you were using Adderall, for instance, that's a big one that we have. Um, if you use Adderall and you can provide all the documentation and records, and if you had any type of education plan or anything like that, then you would have to provide all that information. Um, and then you would probably most likely be cleared. Uh, and if you use Adderall yesterday, unfortunately, you're most likely going to be disqualified. <laughs> so I hope for the time being, for the time being, I hope yeah. that, uh, answers your question. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's based off the time and like, like Sarah was saying, for example, if you would say, yeah, when I was in high school. I was on Adderall diagnosed with ADHD. You know, one of the first things they're going to ask for is your high school transcripts because they want to see what was going on with your classes and things like that. They're going to want all the doctor's notes when, like you said, when they stop. But if it happened, if you just stopped last month or even two months ago, more likely we're going to say that because we have regulation where it said you have to be off it for what, like six months to a year now. Um, because the MEPS, the military engine processing station won't even look at you anyway. They're just going to say, they're going to kick your pre screen back and say, resubmit in six months or something like that. So um, at that point, we, we probably wouldn't waste your time, just kind of give you some sort of timeline and say, listen, we're not, we're not going to be able to do anything with you for another however many months. I've done those evaluations before, and uh, the standard that I'm familiar with is you're more likely to get a waiver approved and it's never guaranteed, but you're more likely if you're able to show that you've been able to function at whatever level you'd be required to function as a military member in the absence of medication. If you require medication to, um, to function at the level of a psychologist, from the military's perspective, they have to imagine you being in a situation where you're not able to get those medications. And if you're functioning completely nosedives, that, that's a problem. Right. So the thing to go by is, does the, do they have, or were they able to pass their, get through their doctoral program unmedicated or, or for a significant chunk of it, or were they able to show job, job functioning? Right. Um, or always required that med and what's going to, what's it going to look like if they can't get it? And even going to OTS, I mean, you can't take prescriptions there. Like if you were on something like that, Adderall or whatever, I mean, you can't even take that with you there. Uh, what if you have a prior service individual who has PTSD from their first um, duration of service caused by the military, then would that be like preclude them from coming back into the service? It would still be evaluated to the MEPS, and more likely they're going to want a psych eval on it, um, especially if the individuals taking any medications or is, you know, to look further into the diagnosis. So, I mean, us as recruiters, like I said, we, we're given some guidance on what we can kind of stop at the door just so we don't waste the applicant's time. Mm -hmm. um, but it, when it comes to um, certain situations, you know, that we're unsure because we're not doctors and we submit it, they're just going to ask us, and it could be a consult or something like that, um, that they're asking for. Sometimes MEPS will pay for it. Sometimes we'll have the applicants go do it themselves, um, you know, or based off the medical records that we turn it. Because if there's anything disclosed for anything at all, we got to turn in medical records anyway. Mm -hmm. So there could be something right there in the records where they say that's a hard no right there. 
um, you know, and it could be uh, us requesting the Surgeon General to allow us to even send this person to the maps. Um, so it's just based off the different situations, what's in the medical records, medications that they're on, or maybe we're on. Um, yeah, it's the situation of the applicant. Can we go by phone? Like oh. history of PTSD alone isn't disqualifying, but how's their current functioning? Have they been through treatment? Um, have they shown evidence um, of, of being able to function effectively that would predict that they'd be able to do so wearing the uniform? I have one last question. So, cause we do have a lot of prior service students at our school. Um, so let's say they wanna go back in and they've already done OTS or some version of that. Do they need to repeat that then in order to go in and be a psychologist? Uh, I think it, it, that would depend on the branch if they were part like a different branch of service. Mm -hmm. But uh, from my experience, if they were part of Air Force, they won't need to go through it again. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, Sorry. I've seen it both ways. This past year, we didn't, um, because of COVID and, and just availability was so low. If you were a prior Marine, you didn't go to OTS. Um, what I've seen happen more often than not is if you were a prior Air Force officer, you wouldn't go to OTS. And I have seen people from other services mm -hmm. end up going, but um, they're a lower priority. So. Awesome. This was this is one of the best. Um, I've been to a lot of these. <laughs> I go to all of them each year. This is the most informative one I've seen, and and you, I feel like, I mean, all the services tell their story and the way they tell it. But you know, since even signing up for the Air Force, I felt like I got the most legit. This is the way it is. If we don't like you and you don't like us, then it's not a good fit. And I appreciate I appreciate that. So thanks. <laughs> Uh, anyways, yes, yes, thank you so much for, for, for a great presentation. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you for having us. And, uh, again, special thanks to major Tubman who was able to log in today to help us out with this presentation. Yeah, um, pleasure. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. And, um, I guess I'll get the link from you, sir. Later yes, I will. Uh, as soon as I'm able to set everything up, give me a couple of days, but you will get it and I will. I'll make sure that you guys can can download it for your purposes. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And we appreciate it. And uh, hope you guys have a great day. And you have our information off to the side there on the chat. And if you guys need anything, feel free to reach out. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks so much. Do Re reach out, please, if, if I can be of any help too. Um, yes. Dr. I was going to ask you if you want to come and talk to my class about those ethical concerns of military psychologists, because I would love yeah. to have that come from, from you guys. Oh boy, that would be awesome. Yeah. Can we do that? Yeah. I would love that. Did you put your email in the, uh, no, let me do that right now. I, I have found that as, as anyone could imagine that if I, um, you know, if we do something like that, that's topic based, um, that's not just, hey, come and come and listen to us talk about just the Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, pe people people are often interested in what is it like to use or to talk about ethical dilemmas or what is it like to talk about trauma therapy, um, you know, in the military, outside of the military, or very, various other topics. Um, that could sometimes get more people, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, that might not attend, you know, maybe a less informative talk. Um, yeah, definitely. I would, I would like to see that because, uh, I mean, our students are, we, we have probably 50 military students that are on our campus and maybe 25 in the military veteran psychology specialization. So I think they would be interested in hearing what you have to say. Oh, so cool. I wrote hey, it down there. The first email I just sent you is a combination of two emails and it's totally oh, Use. I was trying to talk while I typed. Use the second email. Okay. Uh, David.s.tubman.mil at mail.mil. Okay, great. One, totally wrong. <laughs> well, they changed it so many times. It's so complicated now. And if I'm, I'm I was trying to multitask and it, yeah. it didn't work. <laughs> it's a problem for me too. So. <laughs>
thanks very much. I appreciate all of your assistance here. Yeah. Likewise. We'll see I'll you all later. Bye. I'll be in touch with you for sure. Yeah, Thank please much do. To everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye. There we go. Did you do that? There we go. That was Good great. Enough. That was probably the best one. 41. What? The other people said 48. I know. And I'm like, I'm like, somebody either fucking lied to me or they that changed lady, something. what was she doing? She didn't say any of this stuff. She was the worst presentation I ever seen. I mean, I told you my experience meeting her in person, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's just even further confirms that what was wrong with her. <laughs> uh, Let me stop recording. Oh, no. <laughs>